Thank you for joining the podcast. Rabbi Sachs once said, a Judaism divorced from society will be a Judaism unable to influence society. It will live and thrive and flourish behind high walls within its own defensive space, but it will not speak to those who wrestle with the very realities, poverty, disease, injustice, inequality, and other assaults on human dignity to which Torah was directed in the first place. At best, those who engage with the world and are at the same time faithful to Judaism will be divided personalities, unable to integrate the two halves of their being because Torah and Chokhmah are unintegrated in our time. As Sephardim, we don't really relate to this statement as it applies more to the Ashkenazi communities. With that said, what is the traditional Sephardi approach to halakha? Do we take a more stringent or lenient approach? And what is the classical Sephardi approach to halakha and hashkafa in the context of the model of the modern world? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the program. I appreciate it. And chazak baruch and all your important work. The first thing I'd like to do is make a preliminary observation. Rabbi Sachs's comment is not off the wall. It's very perceptive. And I hate to tell you this, but it also applies to Sephardim. Why? And here's why I'd like to the preliminary comment. When we speak about Sephardic life, Sephardic culture, Sephardic being, we have to take into consideration two different realities. There was a Sephardic reality pre-modern, let's say starting, ending in the 1900 even, where Sephardim lived in their own communities, whether in Syria or in Turkey or in Morocco, in Jerusalem, wherever we lived. And we had basically insular communities where we developed our own way of life based on halakha, based on Torah, etc., which was different in certain fundamental ways from Ashkenazim who developed more in European lands. That's number one. But in the modern period, most of our team, and I include myself in the, in the group, are, are already hybrid of our team. What do I mean? I mean, we grew up, I grew up in the United States. I grew up in Seattle, among Sephardim of Judeo-Spanish background. And it was a beautiful civilization, beautiful culture. My grandparents came from the old country. They spoke Ladino. It was a beautiful society. But I went to American schools. My wife was Ashkenazic, went to American schools. We listened to the same music. We read the same books. We were influenced by the same authors. And to a large extent, Sephardic life today is a combination. We're, not, we're no longer living in an insular world, whether here or in Israel. There's already now a Sephardic Ashkenazic coming together. My basic theory is that 100 years from now, it won't matter if you're Sephardic or Ashkenazi. What will matter is that you should be Jewish. And what should matter is that each tradition, Sephardic, Ashkenazic, Yemenite, Italian, Greek, whatever it is, the best of all those traditions should find their way through the centuries so that our future generations will be stronger and happier. So I believe that the Sephardic tradition as it was pre-1900, let's say, has many valuable principles, very valuable ideas. But I believe also that instead of focusing on our ethnicity, we should be already in a post-ethnic mode. We should be thinking not about how Sephardim did it in Morocco or Turkey or Syria, but how our grandchildren and great-grandchildren are gonna do it 100 and 200 years from now. So with that said, Rabbi Sachs, with whom I have great admiration, he was a great man, he says that there is a split, and you pointed it out that it's kind of an Eskenazi split between maintaining a religious life on the one hand and a mod modern outgoing activist life on the other hand. And maybe to some extent that was true a hundred years ago. But for Sephardim and Eskenazi of this generation, it doesn't, it isn't always true and it doesn't have to be true. I mean to say this, the Jewish tradition essentially is an activist tradition. When God gave us the Torah at Mount Sinai, he didn't expect us to live in ghettos. He expected that the Midrash tells us that the, God gave the revelation at Sinai in 70 languages. Now the Israelites didn't know 70 languages. So what's the Midrash trying to tell us? The Midrash is telling us the Torah has relevance to all the nations of the world. So within our tradition, there already is this idea that Judaism has a message for everybody, not just for Jews, but for the world. So the idea of a, developing a wholeness um, is very is fundamental to Judaism in general. And the way the Sephardi were in the olden days, I'm talking about the pre-modern period, I think the great emphasis was on this wholeness. I think once we came into conflict with the modern period, 
Sephardim also started getting bifurcated. We also got just as confused as Eskenazim, or getting as confused. So what's happening in the Sephardim world as I see it, is two things. On the one level, people are moving further away from Judaism, thinking Judaism doesn't have the answers, they need to live a happy life. And on the other side, becoming more and more ethnic. You want to be more parochial, hang on to every single minhag. Whether it makes sense or not for our future generations doesn't matter. But we're deaf Sephardic, we're Moroccan, we're Syrian, we're Turkish, we're Greek. We're, and I'm not against ethnicity, I think it's fine. But I think the emphasis sometimes has to be beyond ethnicity. We're not just our own Turkish or, or uh, Syrian or whatever we are. We're also human beings. Human beings that are open to the, all the wisdom of the world. So when you go to your question, a traditional Sephardic approach to halakha. Well, I used to think, and I did a lot of research and I've written a lot on the subject, and I used to think there is such a thing as a traditional Sephardic approach, and I still do believe that. But I have to think, my thinking has become nuanced over the years. Sometimes people say, Sephardi are more lenient, Eskenazi are more stricter. Rabbi Ovalia used to say, Ovalia Yosef used to say, Sephardi are from Beit Hillel, Eskenazi are from Beit Shammai. And in some stereotypical way, it might be true. But in reality, there are some Ashkenazic post game who are wonderful and very open and very compassionate. And there's some Sephardic post game who are very narrow and very machmir and everything. So I don't like to make any more any kind of generalizations. Having said that, I'll make a generalization. <laughs> I'll make a generalization from the way I grew up. So I grew up in a community um, in Seattle of Judeo-Spanish Jews from Turkey and the island of Rhodes. In our community, there were people who were very observant and people who weren't observant at all. This is a very difficult time in history. They were trying, these immigrants were trying to adapt to American life. They were trying to make a living. They're trying to raise families, a lot of conflicts. But I'm talking now about the traditional, I grew up fortunately among the traditional element of the community. My uncle was Rabbi Solomon Maiman. Uh, I grew up more or less in a religiously observant home. And in, uh, that was the world that I came from. But we had no such thing as Haredism. The word wouldn't, we wouldn't even resonate to it. Humot were completely out of the question. The idea was, you be a Jew, be happy. God gave us the Torah, God loves us, we love God, and live a happy, wholesome, beautiful life. I always thought that, Jude, how could people live without Judaism? It's such a happy thing. It's so, so valuable. We, every, we didn't, when we had, my mother used to make Shabbat lunch. We never used to call it Shabbat lunch, we call it Shabbat parties. Because we had not just our family, her children, her grandchildren, neighbors, and cousins, aunties, and uncles, it was a more, uh, extended family used to come, visitors come. It was always very exciting and very happy. And I think the one characteristic I remember most about growing up in Seattle was we never felt guilty about being things. We never felt guilty. We never felt we're sinners, we're horrible people. Even when saying we said Salihot, they were to happy tunes. We felt good. <laughs> How can you say you're, you're telling God you're saying that you've made all these terrible sins and you're singing about it? For Sephardim, it wasn't an anomaly. It was where God loves us. God wants us to repent. God wants us to live happily. So I grew up in that kind of tradition. So when you say Sephardim are more lenient or not lenient, I'm not sure that the question is leniency or not leniency. I would like to say traditionally, my imagination is Sephardim are more humane in the sense we kept all parts of life in focus. In, in the tradition I grew up in, the, the old timers, even the very religious old timers, sang love songs of Madino. The Romanceros were very popular. No one thought it was shameful or question of the youth. Women sang, men sang. It was very natural and religious. It wasn't, the, there were no lines. You you'd go to synagogue on Shabbat and you sit next to one person who was a big Tamil Chacham and next to him was a person who had a ham sandwich for breakfast and no one said boo. No one said, you're better than me, I'm better than you, I feel guilty, I don't feel guilty. It was much more accepting and realizing that different people have different values and are on different levels, different rungs in the traditional sphere. <laughs> now, my heroes as, as Poskim are Rabbi Benzion Uziel, I wrote a book about Rabbi Uziel, and his student, his disciple, Rabbi Chaim David Halevi, I also wrote a book about him. These are the two great, in my mind, the two great post of modern times among the Sephardim. When I read them, and I, Baruch Hashem, I knew Rabbi Halevi in person. When I read their works, and I spoke to Rabbi Halevi, these were quotation marks, old-fashioned rabbis. They didn't go to universities. They didn't read uh, philosophy. 
but they had innate wisdom, common sense. So um, I always say this, sometimes you ask a rabbi a question, and the first thing they do is say, let me see what my book says. What does Shulchan Aruch say? What does Ramam say? What do the Poskim say? Etc. But I think when you ask Rabbi Uziel or Rabbi Halevi a question, and I call this this traditional Sephardic approach, the first thing they do is look in your eye. Why did you ask me that question? How will my answer affect your life? What is the implication of my research? What is, what's going on in the human dimension? Not what do the books say, but what do you and I say? Then once we get a sense of the humanity of the situation and the implications, then we go to the books to find out what this rabbi said and that rabbi said. But there's a certain humane, humaneness to it. I wrote an essay uh, some years ago um, about the Sephardic, uh, Sephardic rabbinic leadership. It's on my website, jewishideas.org. Um, and I started off with a quotation from Rabbi Ovadia Yosef when I was just still a young rabbi, because it goes back many years. Uh, rabbi Ovadia Yosef was Roshon Rishon Letzion, and he made a speech and came to New York, and he spoke about the uh, Sephardic approach and the Sephardim, as I said before, are Bet Hillel, we, we have emphasized Chesed, Ashkenazim emphasize Gevura, Ashkenazim are stricter, they're tougher. And of course, as a young rabbi, I was only too happy to hear that because it reflected what I grew up with, that kind of tradition. But as I studied more about it, I realized, as I said before, there's, there are nuances. But I was trying to look at rabbinic models that, that I had in my own life, Sephardic and Ashkenazi. And I found that the Sephardic ones were also great Tamilei Chachamim, very learned, but they were very sensitive to human feelings. Not that the Ashkenazim weren't, the Ashkenazim also were. But the Sephardim had a certain nuance. First, let me, an, let me give an example. When I was a young rabbi, I used to have to go to meetings and conferences and ladies groups and sisterhoods. And I thought, this, is, this isn't what I should do. I should be sitting down, I should be learning, I should be writing, I should be researching. So I went to my teacher, Chacham Solomon Gaon, of blessed memory. Chacham Gaon, do me a favor. Tell all these people to leave me alone. Let me sit and learn. Let me learn. Let me read. Let me write. Let me, let me con con concentrate on what I can do best. To go to all these meetings, it's a, it's a waste of time. He looked at me. I thought he would say, what a wonderful young man I have here. What a bug. Future great Tamir Chacham. He didn't say that. He said, you know, I'm very disappointed in you. I said, what? You're disappointed that I want to learn and I want to write and I want to read and I want to teach? No, no, those are good things. But the community has to see a rabbi there with them. These people are giving their time. They're raising money for tzedakah. They're trying to run the synagogue. They're trying to, 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 to work for this cause, for the state of Israel, this, that, the next thing. They need to see the rabbi there. The rabbi is not supposed to be an aloof person sitting in a room learning. The rabbi has to be a presence in their lives. Oh, I said, Chacham, you taught me something very important. To be a rabbi, isn't just to be a brilliant scholar, although it's nice to be that if you can be it. It has to be a human being, a person who cares, a person who gives his life to the community. If you're not prepared to do that, don't be a rabbi, be something else. To be a rabbi in a community, you're obligated to understand the people, to spend time with the people, and that's not wasting time. That is your life. If you bring people closer to Torah, you have to understand who they are. This to me epitomizes in a nutshell something about what I call Sephardic rabbinic mystique. When I was very young, before I was a rabbi, I was, we were, my wife and I, I was still in rabbinical school, we traveled to Istanbul, and we knew Rabbi Nisim Bahar, Allah Shalom, in Istanbul, great rabbi. And on Friday, he told us, I'm going to go shopping for, uh, before Shabbat, uh, come with me shopping. He stops at this store and he buys some tomatoes. He goes to the next store, he buys some potatoes. He goes to the next store and he buys some carrots. Every store is, so I said, Rabbi Bahar, why are you stopping so many stores? You go to one place, you can buy all of them. He says to me, Todos son judios. All those people are Jews. They need to know the rabbi supports the Parnassa. The rabbi cares about their business. Oh, that's a rabbi. That's a rabbi. Not the one who just sits in the Beit Midrash studying all day. That's good. Nothing, you have to study the Beit Midrash. But you have to be a human being. You have to care about people's needs. So when I talk about the Sephardic approach, halacha, that's what I focus on. The humane aspect of it. The, the bringing the law away from the books and into people's lives. That's what the key is. Okay, I'll stop at that point right now. Yeah, and that's kind of what Rabbi, Rabbi Sachs was saying, that there's like this divorce between the yeshiva and the community in terms of how the rabbis kind of influence um, the society at large. So um, I think you really put it so well. 
Nice. Um, you want to take on the next sure. question? Okay. Um, so we live in